As mayor, I call this meeting of Stanton City Council to order. I know that this meeting is being broadcast over the city's cable channel and stream, line, stream live, excuse me, on the city's website so that members of the public may hear our meeting. The meeting is also being recorded. I ask the clerk of council to call the roll for confirmation of those council members present for today's meeting. Mayor Oaks. Here. Vice Mayor Robertson. Here. Mr. Holmes. Ms. Dull. Ms. Dull. Ms. Mead. Here. Mr. Claffey. Here. Ms. Darby. Here. I cannot confirm that all members are present. We are still missing Mr. Holmes and Ms. Dull. Okay, Mr. Holmes indicated that he was running five minutes late. So. All right, thank you. I ask that city manager Steve Rosenberg note the participation of any city officials or colleagues or anyone else during today's meeting by Zoom or telephone. Madam Mayor, um, participating on the Zoom platform, we have council member Brenda Mead. Uh, I am anticipating that uh, council member Carolyn Dole will also be on the Zoom platform. Uh, we have Jen Serber and CJ Tyree. Uh, representatives of Middlebrook, Middlebrook Trace, Virginia, LLC. And uh, during the work session, all other participants are in council chambers, including uh, the city's interim city attorney, Andrew McRoberts. Thank you. Please let me mention that notice reasonable under the circumstances of this meeting has been given to the public contemporaneously with the notice provided to members of city council. In addition to limited public seating in City Hall, access to this meeting has been provided to the public by audio feed on the city's cable channel and the city's website. During this work session, as in the past, there will be no opportunity for public comment. Public comment will be received during council's regular meeting, which will begin at 7.30 p.m. Instructions for public comment by telephone can be found on agenda for the regular meeting and on council's website at www.ci.stanton.va.us backslash government backslash city council. Also, let me highlight and have reflected in the meeting minutes that this meeting, although being conducted in person, is also being conducted by Zoom with virtual participation by certain members of city council, given the catastrophic nature of the declared emergency and disaster related to COVID-19 outbreak, which is part of the total circumstances makes it impractical or unsafe to assemble in a single location. The meeting is being held consistent with the city council ordinance 2020-04 regarding continuity of government a copy of which can be found online at www.stanton.va.us backslash COGORD 2020-04 as extended by City Council Ordinance Number 2021-06. All right, it, it really sounds like um, the audio is coming through exceptionally well tonight, so good job. Uh, to the IT department on the upgrades. All right, um, I would just like to remind everybody that if you come into the city council chambers or anywhere in city hall, if you can please uh, wear your mask. We also provide hand sanitizer at the entrance um, of the chambers. And if um, there comes the opportunity that you wanna speak at the podium, we also provide hand uh, sanitizer wipes. Uh, in addition uh, to the city council members, if you would like to speak, please recognize the mayor and the mayor will recognize you. All right, with that said, that takes us to item number one, a discussion and consideration of resolution of the council of the city of Stanton, appointing and acting an interim clerk of council and authorizing the city manager to designate such person in certain circumstances. Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor and members of council. Uh, we're a little bit out of order this evening to deal with this item first before you formally approve your agendas for the work session and the regular meeting. As you know, uh, 
Faith Simmons, Clerk of Council, has resigned effective as of tomorrow, February 26th. And so um, because she won't be here to approve uh, uh, or to prepare minutes of this evening's meetings, um, because tomorrow is her last day, we determined in consultation with Mayor Oaks to have Morgan Smith uh, in the city manager's office clerk the meeting this evening. So it's necessary for you to designate her as the acting clerk for today and tomorrow, uh, overlapping with Faith Simmons while she continues to hold the position of clerk of council. And then effective um, as of the first, uh, I think February 27th, which is Saturday, um, uh, Morgan has kindly agreed to serve as your interim clerk of council while you all go through the process of finding your new clerk. And we'll talk about that later in the work session. So you have a single resolution before you for your consideration now at the front end of both meetings to appoint Morgan as the acting clerk for two days and then the interim clerk beginning Saturday until the date on which uh, you appoint your new clerk of council and your new clerk takes the position. And then the resolution um, further instructs me to take action to provide for a temporary increase in Morgan's salary, which is consistent with what we do administratively. Uh, when we have somebody, for example, act um, on an interim basis as a department head while we're recruiting, uh, but because the clerk is council's appointee, we felt it was appropriate to include that provision in the resolution as well. And then finally, the resolution in order to provide some flexibility um, allows me to designate someone other than Morgan to clerk meetings, for example, of the Historic Preservation Commission or the Planning Commission um, in the interim uh, so that you know Morgan's going to do the best she can to cover as many bases as she can, but she's got a full-time job um she has some pursuits outside of her work hours and so uh with this final provision of the resolution it authorizes me to designate uh a, another member of staff for example somebody in the community development department to act as clerk for some of these other uh meetings of city boards and commissions i'd be pleased to answer any questions right are there any questions for mr rosenberg Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Council Member Claffey. I move the council adopt the proposed resolution appointing Morgan C. Smith, acting and interim clerk of council for the period stated in this resolution and authorizing the city manager to designate a clerk of council in certain circumstances to serve as clerk to bodies other than council. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I second. Madam Mayor, I second. Um, what okay. <laughs> <laughs> I heard Council Member Darby second. All right. Any further discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Miss Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Morgan, for your willingness to serve. So, and also please note that um, Council Member Holmes and Council Member Dole um, are in attendance. All right, the second item is a consideration of work session and regular meeting agenda. Madam, order, Madam Mayor. Um, Vice Mayor Robertson. I'd like to move to approve the work session agenda and the regular meeting agenda with the following change. As to the regular meeting, the addition of item F, which will be a discussion and consideration of a letter to the governor of Virginia 
concerning deferred implementation of Senate Bill 1157 relating to municipal elections. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Council Member Darby. I second that. Right, we have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. The next item is item number three, a presentation of Middlebrook Terrace. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, did somebody say something? Trace, oh, I'm sorry, I, I said Terrace, didn't I? Forgive me. Presentation by Middlebrook T Trace, Virginia, LLC, concerning proposed development of 914 Middlebrook Avenue for multifamily use. Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Rodney Rhodes, the city's senior planner, will present this item. Good evening, Mayor Oak, city council members. Um, ton tonight, um, there is a presentation regarding a proposed development at 914 uh, Millbrook Avenue. This is a proposal to develop it for 82, as an 82 unit apartment complex for low and moderate income families. The property is approximately 24 acres. It's zoned R4, which is high density residential. In the R4 district, multifamily is permitted by right as long as it's within the density um, regulations of the district and as long as it goes through the site plan process. So there, there is no public process in order for multifamily to go on this property. It's well within the density um, restrictions um, you know, on 24 acres of proposing 82 units. Um, however, this would be a federal tax credit project with funding received through Virginia Housing, which is formerly the Virginia Housing Development Authority. And in order, and this has to go through a competitive application process. In order for the application to be more competitive, um, council is requested by the developer to, to adopt a re revitalization area resolution and a tax abatement ordinance the developer has provided samples of that in your packets um, and staff intends to advertise. I would note that the tax abatement requires a public hearing. So staff intends to advertise that for your meeting next month, your, your next meeting, and also to put um, the other item on your agenda for your consideration. So that would be at the March 11th, 2021 regular meeting. And at this time, I'll turn it over to the developers or representatives of the developers um, we have Jen Serber and I believe CJ Tyree on the Zoom platform to talk about this proposal and to answer any questions you may have. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for uh, allowing us to be here with you this evening. Uh, we uh, are basically here to just answer any questions. Um, I put the packet together that I believe everyone has in front of them. Um, it's a general description of the property that's being proposed, which is, as Mr. Rhodes described, an 82-unit multifamily apartment community in two three-story buildings. Uh, the, outs, the exterior facade will be at least 85% brick, um, all units serviced by elevators and universally designed with at least nine being fully type A 504 handicap accessible. Um, and all units affordable to a range of income families uh, from 30% to 80% of the area median income. Uh, we are requesting two items to be considered, uh, which I've drafted sample agenda items there for you. The first one uh, being the tax abatement ordinance. Um, and the second one being the revitalization area resolution. Does anyone have any questions about the agenda packet? Are there any questions? Development? Madam Mayor, if I may, yes. and, and we Mr. can Harrison. have more information for you about this at the next meeting when the tax abatement ordinance is on your agenda for the public hearing and for consideration, but the I want to note that the ordinance or the abatement that's being sought is only a partial abatement. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it, I think rel relatively minor 
um, when you take into account the total value of the project. And we will have uh, the city assessor, Charlie Haney, um, you know, work up, um, uh, you know, I, I hesitate to even call it a pro forma, but something that gives you a sense of what kind of real property tax revenue might be expected to be derived from a project like this um, so that you can compare that to the abatement that's being requested. If I, because if I recall correctly, and Ms. Serber, maybe you can address this, there's a limit to the actual dollar amount of the abatement that you're requesting. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. So the abatement would be limited to no more than $2,000 annually for only three years on the increase of the property value. And so I think members of council, the potential revenue from a, a project of this magnitude is significantly more than, than $2,000. Vice Mayor Robertson. Um, is, and, and if I'm, I'm not, if I'm not correct on all this, but are, are any of the apartments, or maybe they have to be, but are, are they going to be, uh, some of them be handicap accessible uh, as far as that you know, door width and everything that, yes, that all that pertains to? Yes, sir. If, uh, if you look at the sheet um, in the first paragraph under the pro project description, okay, it answers your question there. Uh, okay. Yep, yep. Um, so, so both buildings will be serviced by an elevator making every unit, all 82 units, universally designed, uh, meaning that, and I listed some of the features there for you to give you some examples of what that, some of those features means, but for example, you have a removable cabinet base underneath the kitchen sink, so that if a person were living in that unit, and they did not require the feature to be accessible to them like a person in a wheelchair might, the cabinets would remain in place and serve as extra storage in their kitchens. But if a tenant later on moved into that same unit and uh, happened to be in a wheelchair, we could remove those cabinet bases so that they could access and actually slide fully under, fully under their kitchen sinks. As an example, uh, but all of the doorways would be wide enough in every unit for the for the units to be visitable by a person in a, in a wheelchair. Um, but then all, in addition to the universal design features, at least nine of the 82 would be type A fully accessible 504 units. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so the deadline for this is March 18th. So we'll have it on the, next meeting That's, agenda, which is March 11th? Yes, the developer's application deadline is March 18th. Um, so we will have the two items mm -hmm. on the agenda for March 11th, one of which requires a public hearing. And I would just reiterate what Mr. Rhodes has said to you. This is a buy right development. Mm -hmm. um, and so it has to meet the site plan requirements under the city code. And the only reason that it's before council is because the developers have requested these two actions right. to enhance the scoring of their application to Virginia Housing. And uh, so, uh, um, but March 11th, yes, it'll be uh, both, uh, both of the uh, action items will be on that agenda. All right, thank you. Are there any Hello, additional- Ms. Brenda Mead. Council Member Mead. I, uh, Mr. Rosenberg or, or one of the folks who, who are from Middlebrook, could you give me a little bit more background on the revitalization area um, a requirement? Yes, ma'am. May I say one more thing about the tax abatement ordinance piece before we move on to the second agenda item? Certainly. Uh, if, you, if you'll note um, in the draft of the tax abatement ordinance that I provided in paragraph three, um, and Mr. Rhodes, uh, you mentioned this earlier, and, and this is just taking a stab at it. And of course, uh, these numbers may be adjusted, but I did want to mention this. Um, so the subject property, along with improvements currently located there, is assessed at $243,930 for tax year two, 20, 2020. 
Um, and the cost of the intended improvements, our estimated development cost is 11,480,000. Currently, the property is paying $2,317.34 annually. That's the 2020 uh, tax owed. Uh, assuming an 11,480 development cost, if the property were assessed at that number, um, it would result in an increase of 106,742.66. And I just wanted to call your attention to that because again, we're only requesting a $2,000 reduction and only for three, a period of three years. Okay. So those are, those, are, those are the numbers as we've taken a stab at them. We may not be exactly right, but we, we think they're pretty close. Okay. And then Council Member Mead, can you um, repeat your question, please? No uh, need. I, I heard I it. Looking I, for I'm more sorry. information on the topic of the revitalization area that yes, also we're going to be addressing. Yes, ma'am. And I, I don't mean to have you repeat your question, so I'm, I'm sorry for that. I heard it. I just wanted to bring those numbers up uh, just to call everybody's attention to it. Uh, so, yes, the second agenda item is the revitalization area resolution. Uh, to qualify for revitalization points, state law allows the city council to pass a resolution supporting the site for the apartments as a quote unquote revitalization area. That resolution can be made specifically and only for this property without affecting um, any adjacent or surrounding properties. By the city council agreeing that it meets the code requirements. So in the draft resolution, I've taken out the items that we feel are non-applicable and provided you a plat showing you exact acreage of the property in question. But it is, uh, if you go to that next page where it says general instructions designation to qualify for revitalization area points, select one of the following. So this property does not qualify for number one, two, three, or four. So, so we'd like to call your attention to number five, and we believe that it does meet this definition of a revitalization area defined by Virginia Code Section 36-55 reference there at the top. Uh, and then if, if you look at the resolution draft, we have eliminated, if you see in bold there where it says either one or two and, we have eliminated number one. So we're asking the city council to agree with us that this development, this economic development of this site will benefit the city um, and that private investment are not reasonably expected without assistance, meaning the credit itself, to produce the construction of decent, safe and sanitary housing that will meet the needs of low and moderate income residents. So basically it is uh, it's a way for this for the council to say we believe that the development is beneficial to the city by providing decent safe and sanitary housing for individuals or families between the 30% and 80% AMI income brackets. Did I answer did I fully answer your question? Uh, yeah, is there any are there any um, uh, uh, implications in the future? No man. Uh, on this, no, this is simply no, with respect to this property, it doesn't impact any surrounding properties. That's correct. It can be for this particular track and only this track without having anything to do with any adjacent or neighboring track or surrounding track. The only thing that we will do with this resolution is place it into the application, receive 15 points, and then never do anything with it again, it obligates the city to nothing financial or otherwise. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. This is Carolyn Dahl. Council Member Dahl. Uh, I know that the, the project's for low to moderate income. And so I, I wondered, what do you see as the, uh, the, the rental uh, price for the low income and how many units are designated that way versus the price for the moderate income and how many units are designated that way. Yes, ma'am. Uh, if you will bear with me momentarily, please. Uh, let me see if I can get out of the exit. Um, and by okay. the way, I, I like your banjo. Oh, thank you. I have a really cool story about that banjo, but I won't take your time in telling it right now. 
so in the current model, uh, we have rent and income targeting, 10 units at 30% area median income, 30 units at 50% area median income and rents, 12 at 60% and 30 at 80. So for the two bedroom, 50% units, those will be rented for our current, our current model, so it's $640. The two bedroom 60% units are now at 801. And the two bedroom 80% units will be 1050. And then on the three bedroom 30% units, uh, excuse me, 50% units, they would be at 715. The 60% units would be at 900. And the 80% units would be at 1150. So you have rents ranging from $640 per month to $1,150, depending on the income of the, of the individual or family. All right, thanks. Yes, ma'am. Any additional questions? Yeah, Council Member Holmes. Uh, Ma'am, how, how many people do you uh, anticipate? What's the high end as the number of occupancies and, 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 and you know, that would be in this uh, complex? How many people uh, do you think would be living there roughly? Uh, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, I mean, we, we are proposing 42 bedroom units and 42. Two, excuse me, 42 two bedroom units and 43 bedroom units. Um, I have some data from the management company uh, that, that I use in, in my developments. And CJ, I don't know if you have some data that could be shared with the council on average family size per bedroom type. Yeah, we typically assume, uh, so not assume, we know that we won't allow more than one and a half or, or two people per bedroom. So when we get into, you know, 42 bedrooms, it's a maximum of 80 and uh, 42 three bedrooms would be a maximum of 126. So that's the really high end. We typically see occupancy more in the neighborhood of one and a quarter to one and a half per bedroom. So that gets a little bit convoluted there, but I would tell you that if you take one and a half per bedroom, you're you're looking at something like um, 200 ish people, 225 somewhere in that neighborhood. And again, that includes that's all people, including you know families with children. So that's you know parents, children. That's all occupants included. Um, but we do have a maximum on there uh, so that we don't have 10 people you know living in a two bedroom apartment. So there there are occupancy maximums. But I would tell you for a, a guesstimate, I would tell you 200 to 225 is probably the neighborhood it would be. Is the maximum. Yeah. This, is, this is Brenda Mead. I just have one more question, and you may not know this, but um, do, do you know if, the, if this uh, site would be served by public transportation? Um, yes. Uh, uh, yes. Um, so for the application purposes, the scoring criteria is being within a quarter of a mile from a public transportation bus stop as the crow flies, not as you drive it. Um, and there is a bus stop I know located within that quarter mile as certified by the civil engineer working on this site, but I can't, I'm sorry, tell you exactly where it is right this second. Well, since most people don't fly, <laughs> True. I'd be interested Please, uh, in knowing. That's right. Well, as you can imagine, because it's a competitive process, uh, there, you know, folks push all sorts of things to say they should qualify for points, but that's the definition as uh, the Virginia Housing has now. It is, though, within a quarter mile from a stop. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right. Any additional questions? Councilmember Holmes, do you have uh, do you have the the where the stop is? Do you know what uh, the address or point street or whatever that it stopped on? I, you know, I am very sorry that I do not know the exact location of that site, but I can e I can find out and email it to uh, Mr. Rhodes tomorrow. I'm making myself a note right now. It looks like the closest stop is on Bridge Street, 
That's right. Um, so the route travels Middlebrook. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure which direction it goes, but there's just a stop right on Bridge Street at its intersection with Maple, which is, uh, I guess, just north of Middlebrook Avenue. Mm -hmm. That's the closest stop. Is there a sidewalk in that area, Steve? Or is, or people uh, not on Middlebrook Avenue. There's a wide shoulder on both sides of the road, if I recall correctly. Thank you. All right. Any we, would, we would be required as a part of the Virginia housing, uh, regardless of the site plan requirements in the city of Stanton, uh, the development would be required to have a sidewalk to the public access point. And that sidewalk would be uh, less than 5% slope and accessible to all residents. Okay. All right. All right, thank you. Um, one last time, any additional questions? All right, I'd like to thank the Middlebrook Trace VA LLC for joining us tonight. And that um, takes us on to number four on the agenda, a discussion of recruitment of clerk of council, Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, um, as, as you and other council members may know, um, under the position description for the clerk of council, the, the deputy or assistant city manager is responsible for the day-to-day -day supervision of the clerk of council, um, in working with the mayor closely in that regard. And so Ms. Beauregard is prepared to lead you through this discussion. Thank you, Ms. Beauregard. Yes, great, thank you. Um, so yes, um, Mr. Rosenberg did mention earlier that this tomorrow, mm -hmm. How we'd like to recruit. Oh, Can you hear me? Well, it went in, it went out. Now it's oh, back. Okay. Okay. Um, how um, you all would intend to recruit for that position. So this is the purpose of this item is to have that discussion and to start that discussion. So for those of you um, who haven't been on council, uh, Mayor Oates remembers has some history and council member Dahl as well. Back in 2012 or up to 2012, um, there was a full-time clerk. Um, she retired. And at that time, it was decided that that job would be consolidated with the paralegal position in the legal office. And so that clerk was doing the paralegal job and the clerk job at the same time. And that was until around 2017 when that clerk retired. And then it was decided at that time that council wanted a dedicated clerk for them not to share the responsibility with another department. And the rationale at that time was since you had an existing employee doing essentially two jobs, that the clerk could be a part-time position. And so that is what it has been since that time and that Ms. Simmons has been working under the expectation that she would work 20 to 25 hours a week um, in that job. Um, I will say um, that um, Ms. Simmons, I know Mayor Oates can speak to this as well in our, um, when we did her evaluation this past year, expressed, um, you know, it's told us very clearly that that wasn't enough hours, that the position was very demanding, that the job um, had more demands on it than when she started three and a half years ago. Um, so there was some, um, you know, definitely some, um, she was having difficulty with the amount of hours that she was expected to work in and to get the job done. And so did I just go out? Yeah, okay. Just for a second. Um, so, and given the fact that it used to be a full-time position, um, you know, that might be part of the discussion this evening is whether you all decide to make that a full-time position again. Um, and, you know, some of the benefits to that might be that that position could be a more traditional clerk of council that you see in other jurisdictions. Um, that person could have more of a role in preparing and developing the agendas for each week. Um, that person could also uh, focus on their professional development because there are professional organizations that are dedicated to the clerk of council profession. And so they have training and conferences. Um, so, and then also it's having somebody in the office 40 hours a week who could attend to citizen issues, attend to city council members, um, work with the city manager's office. And so there could be, there would certainly be some benefits to that. Um, 
So that being said, um, Mr. Venn, our Chief Human Resources Officer is also here and could answer any questions. I did uh, respond to Mayor Oaks earlier. We don't feel the need to hire a headhunter for this. We can certainly do this in house. And the timing of this could be, you could decide to either start the process now. Uh, ideally, you probably wouldn't get somebody in the door until May. So even if it was in the current fiscal year that we're in, we'd really only have two months to cover. And then in July 1st, you'd have a new budget, which would then be fully funded. Um, and we could figure out how we would cover those two months. Or you could wait until July 1st, which is another option. So there's a few options out there. And Mr. Venn is here to answer questions as well. So, okay, so that being said, we'd love to get some input from you all tonight as to how you would like us to proceed with this. All right. Are there any comments or questions by council members? Well, council member Holmes. Uh, uh, Mayor Oaks, I, I think that we probably ought to look at getting somebody full time. I think that, uh, especially since they're going to be on a learning curve. So, uh, you know, it, it might be in our best interest to get somebody full time. Vice I'm, Mayor Robertson. I'm in concurrence. I <clears throat> kind of like the idea of having a full time clerk. I reckon my other question would be, if we have a full-time clerk, is she going to be responsible for doing the other things that Faith was doing? You know, I mean, she clerking for or taking on other committees and that type because Faith did a bunch. That would all fall under her, the job description, am I correct? Right now it falls under the job description. If that, if you all wanted to consider changing that, we'd have to figure out oh, who to clerk those meetings okay. as, it, as it is now, they do those. Oh, we just lost you again. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the kinks, working it out. So that's always been, that, that's always been part of the, the clerk has always done that. It, okay, okay. That's, it's, it's, so in recent, memory the clerk has always done it but we believe that there has been a time previously when for example for the historic preservation commission and the planning commission a member of the planning staff has fulfilled that role and in other localities there's some division of responsibility so the clerk of council um or the city clerk is primarily clerking meetings of the governing body and right. a, another member of the staff who's more closely working with the subject area expertise of some of these other bodies is handling those duties and so we might want to leave that open for discussion or be or even be flexible about it um, so that you all can be ensured that you're getting the sort of support that you as members of council expect and desire. In, in my way of thinking, I, and I like the thing where you have somebody is working with a subcommittee that knows about what's going on in that. I mean, they have that knowledge of that and that just having one person, you know, clerking here, clerking there, just, it just makes more sense to have somebody dedicated to cat. That's my own personal view. And that's exactly how it's worked in the jurisdictions I've worked at as well, just as Mr. Rosenberg has described. Yeah. Council Member Holmes. I, I was, my question got answered. Oh, okay. Council Member Claffey. Madam Mayor, I was, um, I was thinking back to a year ago this time when I was running for council, we were having an issue with the minutes coming up in a timely manner and I of course was not privy to what was going on but there was a time period there where we were running several me meetings behind getting approval of minutes and it was difficult to follow from an outsider so I am all in favor of a full-time clerk so that she has the opportunity to get minutes out on a more timely basis and I think it would help us all and I, uh, I'm an advocate of, of the full-time clerk for that very reason. Council Member Holmes. I was just going to say, I didn't realize that we had any trouble getting our minutes out before. And I, this first time I'd heard that, you know. As, I, uh, I brought it up under matters from the public last, last February and March. We, we had several lags there. Mr. Claffey, if I can, I'll just, let me just mention something about um, not just the minutes, but the agenda um, management in general. So we're going to start looking at an agenda management software package. We actually 
have a package with Granicus that we're going to be looking at. There's other packages out there as well on the market. This could help with efficiency of the minutes, as you just mentioned, as long as efficiency with how the agenda is put out. It could improve the user aspect of the agenda in terms of how people see on what they're looking at on the website and finding things more easily rather than a single PDF, for instance. And so um, we will be working on that before we get a new clerk. We're doing that right now, actually. Right. Um, hopefully the new clerk, um, we can find somebody who's clerked elsewhere and would be have experience with these types of packages because they're everywhere. Um, and so we'll be working on that and hopefully that will resolve um, some of the issues just in terms of getting information out quicker, um, just as you were mentioning, so. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Are there any um, questions or comments, especially in relation to part-time versus full-time? May I, may I just add one, yes, one thing about that? Um, City of Stanton's an outlier in terms of having a part-time clerk. Uh, interestingly enough, about uh, two months ago, um, I got an email from Colonial Heights and they did a impromptu survey asking what the current salaries were for uh, clerk of councils. And they sent us back some information that Ms. Beauregard and uh, Mr. Rosenberg have, but we were the only one that responded to their survey that had a part-time, everybody else was full-time. So clearly um, we are an outlier in, in that regard. Madam Mayor. Uh, Council Member Darby. Mr. Venn, thank you. You answered one of the questions that I had uh, is just to get more information in regards to how mm -hmm. it's done across uh, the state. So thank you for that information. And I would support a full-time clerk. Right. Um, I too would support the idea of a full-time clerk. Um, are there any other comments concerning the making the position from part-time to full-time? I'd just like to say, uh, this is Terry Holmes. Council just, Member Holmes. I'm sorry that we lost faith over something like this because, I mean, you know, she was really good at what she did and she really tried hard. And it's just sad that, you know, maybe we should have made it made her an offer before she got so tired that she wanted out you know but i'd like we should you know at least thank her for the job she's done oh well, she's done a wonderful job absolutely definitely um it, i remember when we interviewed her and it was full-time was just not of interest to uh, miss simmons that's i think why she left her other job because so, it was it, too much exactly um Mr. Venn, did you have any other comments guess, that you would like I, to make? I, concern? Yes, um, Mayor Oaks. I guess I would, you know, City Council uh, obviously will have to make a decision in terms of whether it's the, it would go from a part-time to a full-time. And I guess the, the other question that will need to be answered will be when. Time and, time. you know, we, at, at some point, you know, we are, you know, we're almost in March. Um, if you all gave us the green light and pulled the trigger, uh, if you wanted it before July 1, we, we could put something together, get it out early March, and probably have somebody sitting here May 1, hopefully, in that ballpark, if, that's, if that was the pleasure of city council. And I see Ms. Smith over here shaking. <laughs> shaking. Shake your head, yes, please. <laughs> We don't want to burn Ms. Smith out. <laughs> and that way we're looking at really two months of salary in, in the remaining fiscal year. And then, you know, whatever benefits that individual would end up taking. And could you explain the process? Um, would we advertise with a Virginia Municipal League? Yeah, I, I think we would look at VML. We would look at VACO, ICMA. There's Vir Virginia Municipal Clerks Association uh, has a website you can advertise on. I think all of that together and on our website, I believe as a full-time clerk, we would get um, a number of strong applicants for this position. And we would also need, before we would be able to pull the trigger on that, um, Ms. Beauregard has a copy of the uh, job description that we would want you all to put your eyes on, update it, because that would then drive what we need to do in terms of advertising. Okay. Okay, so at this point in time, uh, it appears that, um, there is an interest by the council to make the position full-time from part-time to full-time. Uh, we will need to review the job description um, and we'll need to 
have further conversation as far as um, the, well, the job description itself, along with you know, salary benefits. Um, and then we'll need to start advertising and interviewing and get ourselves hopefully um, not only a, a full-time clerk, but someone that has some experience is always helpful. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add, Mr. Venn? No, not at this point. I, if, you know, I'll, I will wait to uh, hear from you all and Ms. Beauregard the direction you want to go, and I'll be ready to, to assist you all uh, at that time. Or should we just go ahead? And uh, yeah, that's yeah, what I'm asking. I, I don't you... think that you need to take any formal action um, at, at the present time, um, but I, I think if you have a sense amongst yourselves now whether you'd like to move forward um, in the current fiscal year or if you would prefer to align it with the beginning of the fiscal year, that sort of gives us a sense of timeline. Yeah, any thoughts on? I think we should go ahead and do it now. I'm, I'm in agreement. And if it doesn't work out, it'll, you know, we're going to have it by July anyway, but if it does work out and we get a good candidate, let's put her Correct. in place. So let's right. proceed. This is Carol and Dole. I, I had a Remote. question. I had a question about how much additional expense will this be to move from uh, the current 20 hours of part-time or whatever to, uh, to full-time. What's the additional expense? I can share with you you know, I, I, I don't know exactly what we have spent um, with Ms. Simmons in her part-time role to date. That's something certainly we can look at. Um, I'm looking, just, just so you know, I'm looking at the, the salaries from these other localities range from 45, 2000 to uh, almost $70,000, $73,000. So it is all over the place. Um, I, again, I think it's going to be uh, it's doable in terms of the am dollar amount for two months or one month, whatever you know, whatever it would be in terms of a start date. I can find that information out for you, um, Council Member Dahl, and get that certainly get that to you. But I don't have that exact figure. Yeah, that would be great because if I had to guess, I guess it's going to cost us another fifty k and. Of course, budget time is here, and uh, you know when you count VRS and, and health insurance possibilities and, and all of the uh, the FICA and everything. Uh, uh, so I, you know, I would like to see how much money it's going to cost before we just say, "Yay, let's have a full time clerk." I, I again, I don't have the numbers. I'll get that to you. I don't, you know, for two months. If we're looking at a May one start date, two months of salary and two months of benefits, whatever that is. I, I don't think we're going to get in the range of $50,000, but I certainly will get that information to you all. Thank you. The, um, uh, go ahead, Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, I was just I, I wasn't to... talking about the, these two months. I'm talking about for the, a year, an annual salary uh, going to full-time would probably be 50 k more. My apologies. Yeah. Mr. Rosenberg. I was just going to note for council members that I've had a preliminary conversation with Mr. Trayer, who's not here this evening, about the possibility of moving to a full-time position. And so he's at least got that, mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that grain in, in his mind so that he can be thinking about how it will fit into the budget that we will propose to you at the end of March. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, Mr. Venn, the 40 some thousand, the low end, can you uh, tell us which locality pays yeah. that amount and then the, uh, the 70 some thousand? Yes, I locality? certainly can. So Waynesboro is at 45,236 and the 73,000 is Prince George County. We have um, Colonial Heights at 52,006. Chesterfield, 75,000, Dinwiddie, 48, Fredericksburg, 69,000, Martinsville, 49, Petersburg, 64,5, Salem, right down the road, 66, uh, Winchester, 55, and Lynchburg is at 58,000. These are annual salaries. Harrisonburg's at 51, so Yeah, thank you very much. That wasn't on the list. Um, maybe what we could do, uh, Mr. Venn, is... Um, 
obviously Ms. council member doll has asked her question we can provide that information in terms of the additional cost but also share the survey and then talk mr van and i will work on the job description and we'll come up with a recommendation in terms of a salary range because it will be different because right now it's a part-time job so we'll need to come up with whatever that wherever this fits in Yep. Um, to our, you know, to where it fits in with our personnel. So. And we we typically look at in terms of the cost of benefits anywhere from thirty to thirty three percent in that ballpark. Okay. Okay. And you know, a lot of it's driven by health health insurance. Council Member Darby, uh, Mr. Van, go ahead and finish what you were saying. No, I was just going to say that that you don't know until you hire that person whether they take employee only or family plan because there is a significant difference in cost. That's true. My question, um, Ms. Beauregard, from a um, city administration standpoint, what, what's your recommendation? Full-time, part-time? Full-time. And is that, are you, Mr. Rosenberg, are you in agreement too? Uh, yes, we, we've discussed it and we think that there would be a decided benefit to having a full-time clerk. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Holmes? Uh, John, would they, would they be, um, uh, like a job description from before you went to part-time that you could send to us also? Like uh, before it went to? Yeah, because I, I was part-time uh, when I got on with Linda Little and uh, uh, and she was working for Doug and, uh, and for us. Yeah, I will say th the chances that I'm able to find the job description for, I think it was Debbie Lane, who was the last full time? Right. I, I I can do some digging, but it, you know I don't know how long Ms. Lane was with us, but it's been quite some time when she before when she started. So I'm not sure if I would be able to find that job description, Mr. Holmes. But I certainly will look into it. Okay. Are there any additional comments, questions? Okay. So at this point, uh, we're just starting the conversation. Um, so staff will gather information concerning salary, job descriptions. And then uh, we'll come back to the table and continue the conversation. Anything else, Mr. Rosenberg, that you would like to add? Ms. Beauregard? No, ma'am. Mr. Venn? No, ma'am. All right. Thank you. All right. So the next item is, well, our break. Very good. So uh, this now concludes the uh, work session, and we'll come back into session for the regular meeting at 730. As mayor, I call this meeting of Stanton City Council to order. I note that this meeting is being broadcast over the city's cable channel and streamed live on the city's website so that members of the public may hear our meeting. The meeting is also being recorded. I ask the clerk of council to call the roll for confirmation of those council members present for today's meeting. Mayor Oaks. Here. Ms. Darby. Here. Mr. Holmes. Here. Mr. Claffey. Here. Vice Mayor Robertson. Here. Ms. Dull? Here. Ms. Mead? Here. I have confirmed all council members are present. Right, thank you. I ask that the city manager, Steve Rosenberg, note the participation of any city officials or colleagues or anyone else during today's meeting by Zoom or telephone. Madam Mayor, we have many participants on the Zoom platform during the regular meeting this evening. We have Council members Brenda Mead and Carolyn Dull. Uh, we have uh, individuals presenting annual reports this evening Anita Harris and Lisa Shiflett with Shenandoah Valley Social Services. Uh, other individuals participating on Zoom include Carmen Sheets, Brigitte Cowan. Michael Connor and Donald Dolans, and all of those are external individuals who are joining us in relation to certain items that are on the regular meeting agenda this evening. All other city officials and council members are present in chambers. All right, thank you. Please let me mention that notice reasonable under the circumstances of this meeting has been given to the public contemporaneously with the notice provided by members of city council. In addition to limited public seating in City Hall, access to this meeting has been provided to the public by audio feed on the city's cable channel and the city's website. During public hearings towards the beginning of the meeting and matters 
from the public on council's agenda towards the end of the meeting. Public comments will be taken in person and by telephone. Members of the public who wish to participate in such matters by telephone at the appropriate time may call 844-854-2222. And when prompted, enter the access code 619358 hashtag Callers will be recognized in order. The public is reminded that public hearings and matters from the public is a time for council simply to listen to your comments. Each speaker will be limited to five minutes. Detailed instructions for public participation by telephone have been publicized over the course of the past week on the city's website and Facebook page and can be found now on the agenda for this meeting and on council's website at www.ci.stanton.va.us backslash government backslash city council. Also, let me highlight and have reflected in the meeting minutes that this meeting, although being conducted in person, is also being conducted by Zoom with virtual participation of certain members of city council, given the catastrophic nature of the declared emergency and disaster related to the COVID-19 outbreak which is part of the total circumstances, makes it impractical or unsafe to assemble in a single location. The meeting is being held consistent with City Council Ordinance 2020-04 regarding continuity of government, a copy of which can be found online at www.stanton.va.us backslash COGORD 2020-04 as extended by City Council Ordinance number 2021-04. 06. Okay, um, with that said, I'll ask uh, everyone that enters uh, the chambers as well as City Hall if you can please wear your mask. Uh, also, we have uh, hand sanitizing stations outside the um, entrance of the chambers. We also have some sanitizing wipes at the podium if you care to speak. Uh, you can um, make use of the hand sanitizing wipes. Um, we also ask that you be conscientious of social distancing. And I would like to remind the council members when you want to be um, recognized, please, when you speak, recognize the mayor and the mayor will recognize you. All right, with that said, the next item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. If you care, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, the next item is the invocation, moment of silence, and tonight we will have Vice Mayor Mark Robertson. Mr. Vice Mayor Robertson. All right, thank you. Uh, tonight I will be offering a Christian prayer and all those that would like, if you would please bow your head. Dear Father in heaven, grant that we may stand in your grace. Grant that the light of your grace may come to us through your word. Keep us firm in faith until the promised time when your redemption shall come to all the nations on earth. We are often anxious and ask ourselves if people can bear it. Will they learn to listen to your word? Will they remain steadfast when hard times come? Will they turn to you alone, to you who know the hour and appoint the time when we may see the promised day. Dear Lord, I just simply ask that you be with us here tonight, that you be with our president, that you be with our governor, and that you be with us tonight as we make the decisions of our government for our people. And dear Lord, please be here and spread your grace, my dear Lord, on our citizens most of all. In thy heavenly name we pray. Amen. All right. Next is the mayor's report. Um, earlier today, I attended the um, COVID-19 local response team. Um, this was 
held through Zoom and Council Member Mead also attended. Um, this is a group that is um, headed up by Dan Lehman and they're doing just a phenomenal job. There's just um, a few things I would like to uh, point out that they're working on as far as uh, recognizing the fund grant um, priorities that uh, the COVID-19 local response team has listed. Uh, student support centers, the C4 initiative, tutoring network, food and security, housing and homeless prevention, elderly care, mental health, technology and internet access, unemployment and workforce development, the United Way, FEMA, emergency food and shelter funds. Those are just some of the, um, the different um, avenues during the uh, COVID crisis that uh, this group has been working on not only to keep it uh, stable, but to help up uplift it. Also, um, I attended a CAPSAL meeting and right now the CAPSAL board, they are working on their needs assessment, trying to determine what is, um, what is wanted by the citizens in this region. Um, earlier today, several of us on council toured the Middle River Regional Jail because uh, we will be addressing the expansion of the jail in the near future. And so we wanted to be able to take a tour of the jail and see exactly what we're talking about. Um, I took a tour a few years ago and basically it looks the same. However, there's quite a few more inmates at the Middle River Regional Jail today. Uh, along with uh, myself, there was Vice Mayor Robertson Council Member Holmes, Council Member Darby, and Council Member uh, Claffey. Um, I'd also like to mention the United Way has created a Saul Stay Well video. Uh, this, uh, I had the honor of being able to participate in this video. It was a lot of fun. They're going to um, do 30 minute seg excuse me, 30 second segments as far as putting it out there on television is commercials. And this um, can also be found on various um, websites. Uh, Mr. Rosenberg, can it be found on the City of Stanton's website? I'm turning to Ms. Smith to see whether we posted it yet. We are waiting for permission from the United Way to accurately put it up. So it's, I, it's in process. I will look into that. <laughs> um, all right, let's see, what else? Um, the Happy Birthday America group met. Uh, this was their executive board. They have not forgotten about July 4th, but they want to keep safety um, first and foremost. Um, I'd also like to mention uh, Faith Simmons. We discussed it during the work session. Tomorrow is her last day. We would like to thank Ms. Simmons for her service to the city and we wish her well. Are there additional items by members of council? Mayor Oaks, this is Brenda Mead. Council Member Mead. Uh, just a couple things. Um, I attended a meeting with an all volunteer group known as Busk Stanton. Um, the uh, group's intent is to put musicians in outdoor um, locations throughout the city. They've, uh, they started, uh, I believe this past summer and, um, and had musicians on street, uh, on street corners in downtown Stanton. They're looking to expand um, the uh, network of musicians uh, out to the West End and um, potentially where the new uh, Fretwell's location is out uh, Greenville Avenue. Also, uh, with Billy Vaughn's help, um, uh, we ID'd a property in the West End, which is also an opportunity zone area that might be suitable for the Food Hub project. So that property will go into the mix uh, for the consultants to review and um, and who knows, we might get a new business in the West End. And then finally, uh, th this is Black History Month. And, uh, and I came across uh, a story that I'd like to relate uh, about a gentleman named Willis McGlasco Carter. He was born a slave on September 3rd, 1852 in Albemarle County. Uh, he uh, taught himself to read and write, um, but hid the knowledge until after the Civil War. His father was killed in 1863 while being forced to work at the fortifications at Richmond. And once the family was freed, they moved to Waynesboro. 
seeking more opportunities, Carter worked various labor jobs to save money and attend school. He chose to teach after attending sem seminary school in 1878, um, and he returned to Augusta County. He began his career by securing a position at the Smoky Roll Pro School in Stanton from 1881 to 1883. He was then appointed the principal of West End School in Stanton, which he supervised for 15 years. He was a natural leader and became involved in politics. He served as president of the Augusta County Teachers Association from 1886 to 88. Both he and his wife were active in promoting civil rights for blacks, demanding equal education, and encouraging blacks to join the Republican Party, a different Republican Party than today's Republican Party. From 1892 to 1896, he was the editor of the Stanton Tribune, a black newspaper that called for the end to lynching and asked black to, blacks to vote. He went to St. Louis in June 1896 as an alternate delegate to the Republican National Convention, where he was disheartened to see how black delegates were shoved aside during the nomination process. Despite his best efforts, he watched Virginians rewrite their constitution to disenfranchise blacks and turn back the clock on the new freedoms blacks had won. His call for each led equal education and the right to vote went unheeded as Jim Crow laws were put into place. He died in 1902 from tuberculosis and was buried right here in Stanton in the Fairview Cemetery. I think it's important for us to acknowledge uh, the history of uh, local um, uh, African-Americans um, in this uh, month, Black History Month. Great, right. thank you. Any additional comments by members of council? All right, hearing none, we'll move on to the approval of minutes. Um, we're gonna separate these out. So I'll entertain a motion to approve the work session and regular meeting minutes of February 4th, 2021. Yeah, Council Member Holmes. I move to approve the work section and, and the regular agenda of uh, February. Yeah, meeting minutes. And meeting minutes, February 2nd. 2nd? 4th. 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 February 4th, I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, for 2021. For 2021. I'm okay. Sorry. All right. We've I, got the motion on the floor. Do we have a second? I second that. Vice Mayor Robertson has seconded it. Uh, Ms. Smith, will you please call the roll? Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. The next set of uh, minutes is the work session and regular meeting minutes of February 11th, 2021. Council Member Holmes. I move to approve the work session and, and regular meeting of uh, February 11th, uh, 2021, as stated. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I will second that. Uh, the second was by Vice Mayor Robertson. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. That takes us to the regular meeting, which is item A, a public hearing and consideration of a request by Cameron Sheets for a special use permit at 11 Green Hills Drive under the provisions of SCC 18.60.0704B2 General Business District for the establishment of a child daycare facility Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Rodney Rhodes, the city senior planner, will present this item, and I'll remind council that Ms. Sheets, the applicant, is on the Zoom platform. Okay. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Mayor Oak, city council members. As the mayor noted in the introduction of this item, uh, Ms. Carmen Sheets is requesting a special use permit to locate and operate a daycare, uh, child daycare, in an existing building at 11 Green Hills Drive. The property is zone B2 general business district and all daycares re require special use permits. Um, the daycare will, up, will occupy approximately half of that existing bu um, building. The remainder could be used for a, um, a future tenants or, um, and I would note that um, staff has reviewed 
this proposal, and there's a, uh, there's a mistake in the briefing um, stating that um, all of these issues have been addressed. They all are in the process of being addressed, but have not all been completed at this time. And those issues are one, uh, this is a change in use under the building code and therefore a building permit is required. Um, the applicant has made application for a building permit that has been reviewed. And the only thing um, awaiting its uh, approval is this special use permit tonight. And also there's a, some additional information that is needed from the alarm company. Um, the fire marshal has also knew, noted that a fire lane will need to be marked and maintained. Um, and parking is another issue that was reviewed by staff um, because the applicant is required to provide uh, a fenced in play area and the applicant is proposing to do, do that in, a, in part of the parking lot. And that will require the elimination of 15 parking spaces. That's for the play area itself and also to allow um, vehicles, emergency vehicles to get around that area if necessary. Um, city planner Tim Hartless did, did a parking analysis of this and determined that um, this daycare would require 23 spaces, which would leave 22 spaces for future development and use of that building. Um, so staff has no issues with that. Um, parking is based on the proposed use. I cannot tell you how many spaces would be required for the remainder of that building. It all kind of depends on what type of business goes in there. If it's an office space, which I would assume it would be um, at that location, parking requirements are one space per 300 square feet of usable area and one space per three employees. Um, all of this um, adjoining property is zone B2 general business district. Um, I, I would remind council that before we conduct a public hearing, we advertise for two consecutive weeks in the local paper, and we also send out notices to all the adjoining property owners. And just prior to the planning commission's um, public hearing on this matter, we, re we did receive an email from the adjoining property owner. I do not believe this was included in your packet, but this is the owner of uh, 15 Green Hills Drive, uh, Mr. Seth Liskey. And he wrote in support of this re request, stating that uh, the re requested use is appropriate and needed for the community. Um, the plan commission conducted a public hearing on this matter on February the 18th, 2021. And no one spoke in opposition to the request at that time. And at the conclusion of the public hearing, the commission voted five to zero to recommend approval, a special use permit with the conditions um, recommended by staff. Uh, and they are listed in your briefing. I can read them out if you like. Does the uh, council care to, <laughs> I, I believe everybody's already read the, yeah. the briefing. So uh, I think you're fine. If not, I'd be glad to take any questions you have at this time or after you conduct the public hearing. Okay. Uh, and as Mr. Rosenberg noted, the applicant is participating by Zoom Okay. All right. Um, Ms. Sheets, would you care to address the council at this time? Um, no, ma'am, not unless you have questions specifically for me. All right. Are there um, any questions for Rodney Rose or Ms. Sheets? What, Ma uh, Vice Mayor, Mayor Roberts? What, what kind of timeline, Ms. Sheets, are we talking about from beginning of project till time you can have children there at daycare? Well, um, I was hoping actually to be in the building by phase one by March 1st, but of course I've had several roadblocks, um, this last one being the fire alarm system. Mm -hmm. um, I am meeting with another fire company tomorrow to hopefully um, get all of this information and get that started. That would be my last um, thing that I have to do with the exception, of course, of this meeting tonight. Are there any additional questions? All right, Mr. Rhodes, can you please, for um, our folks listening in, um, our citizens, can you describe where this property is located, exactly where it's located in Stanton? Um, I'll, I'll certainly try. I, I believe um, everyone on probably everyone else in this room is more familiar with uh, 
uh, the city than I am, um, being a fairly a newcomer here, but this is at the very northern part um, of the city um, near Verona. It's um, off of Commerce Road. It's on Green Hills Drive, which is um, intersects with Commerce Road right up at Verona. I believe the Moose Lodge is behind it. The Moose Lodge is behind it. Okay. And, and many, many folks, Madam Mayor, may recall the location of Nisa's Cafe, which was at the north end of the city. It's this building. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yes, or the um, high tech salon and spa. Yes. Okay. The light bulbs are now going off for everybody. <laughs> yes, indeed. All right. Thank you. All right, um, we're going to conduct a public hearing. I will bang the gavel. And if you are for this project or against it, and you would like to speak to um, the council, you can either call in through Zoom or you can approach the podium. Um, after we've heard from everyone, I'll bang the gavel and that will conclude the public hearing. And at that point, I will entertain a motion. With that, the public hearing is now open. Would anyone care to address this issue? We have one caller, Madam Mayor, and we can check to see whether they're calling about this item or to speak during matters from the public. Please do. Is the caller on the line? Hello? Hello? Yes, are you calling to address the public hearing item concerning the special use permit or to speak during matters from the public? I'm just waiting on the matters from the public. We'll put you back on hold and come back to you later in the meeting. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? All right. With that, the public hearing is now closed and I'll entertain a motion. Madam, Madam Mayor. Mayor. Council Member Darby. I move that council approve the special use permit for 11 Green Hills Drive with the conditions as recommended by the Planning Commission. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Council Member Claffey. I was like to second that. All right, we have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. The next item is item B, the annual report of Shenandoah Valley Social Services, Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, we have joining us on the Zoom platform, Anita Harris, who's the director of Shenandoah Valley Social Services, as well as Lisa Shiflett, who is the assistant director of Shenandoah Valley Social Services. And I'll turn it over to them for the presentation. All right, thank you, welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. As far as nice to be invited. Um, I wanted to kind of go over our annual report, which you should have a copy of as far as the little brochure. Basically, our annual report covers the time period from July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2020. Um, the first part of that year. Anita, very, can I Anita, can I interrupt you for one moment sure, to, sure. to redirect counsel? You have a hard copy of the Blue Ridge Court Services Annual Report, which is the next item on the agenda. I see many of you looking at it. You're right. Yeah. The Shenandoah Valley Social Services Annual Report is electronically included in your agenda package, which you can access on your iPad. We thought we had a hard copy as well. So, but... We've, we've got it. We've got it pulled up. All right. All right. Go ahead, go Sorry ahead, about that. You may proceed. Thank you. Okay. All right. <laughs> Wonderful technology, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, you've got your copy and I'm not going to go over everything like we've done in the past uh, using a PowerPoint. So, but I will touch on the main things and especially um, the effects of COVID on our agency, which I'm sure everyone is curious about how we've handled that. Um, the first six months of this past uh, annual year, as far as went as normal, um, the last six months from January to June 30th, basically was COVID related. 
and we had to deal with a pandemic as far as with uh, trying to do business differently than what we had in the past. Uh, we were able to get staff to telework, which was something uh, very different for, for us. We were able to get laptops and access to different systems through the state. Um, most of the last past six months of that year, uh, most of the staff were teleworking or rotating teleworking. Uh, we actually worked with clients to basically do business differently. Um, conducting business by virtual visits, by phone, by fax, by email, text. Uh, we had drop boxes and application boxes placed in. Uh, we were doing uh, temperature checks and basically um, having navigation centers that they would go to when they first entered the building. And basically um, just trying to keep our staff safe and keep our clients safe. We were very successful in keeping up our caseloads. Actually, with our benefit cases, they increased about 2% as far as this past year. We got about additional 13,000 applications for SNAP, Medicaid, and TANF. Uh, we had over 28,000 visitors between our two offices in Verona and in Waynesboro, and uh, 28,000, so uh, quite a number. But actually those numbers during the COVID, the last six months of that year of 2000, or the first part of 2020, those numbers we had to reduce drastically. And actually we were able with technology and the different things that we installed, the drop boxes and everything, we dropped our visitation down to 90% of what it was. Uh, presently it's kind of picked up a little bit. It's back up to 85% of visitors. But that's amazing when you think we had 28,000 visitors coming in the, for the year and uh, that much of a reduction. Uh, with our annual report, just to let you know, as far as um, basically of our case loads, those, um, there's a local match that basically that includes Stanton, Augusta County and Waynesboro. The local match is what the percentage of, of uh, responsibility for funding of our programs that the localities have. Pretty much as far as we're reimbursed by the state, as far as 84.5%. The local match is 15.5. Stanton's local match this past year was 26.43. Waynesboro's was 24.38 in Augusta. Uh, county was 49.19. So you can see about a fourth of the local share is supported by Stanton. And it's, if you look at our annual report, you can see there's quite a uh, amount of services and benefits that are actually given out to the public as far as to assist them, as far as with only one fourth local share. So it's a tremendous amount of assistance that is provided. If you look at our Medicaid report, Medicaid numbers, as far as we had over $150 million in Medicaid services that went out to the community. Um, with over 15,000 cases, this is uh, our Medicaid is our biggest program. It has been the, the program that has basically been increasing each year. And this past year, it has drastically increased because we are, because of the public health emergency, with COVID-19, we haven't been able to close cases. We've had to keep cases open. Um, and right now, as far as unless someone is deceased, moves out of the locality or requests their case to be changed, if they have a Medicaid case, it remains open. And it has ever since uh, the beginning of last year. Uh, so those cases are drastically increasing. Our next uh, past, a uh, number of cases is, is with our SNAP, or formerly known as food stamps. Uh, we have over 4,500 cases as far as with SNAP, uh, with over uh, about 15 million as far as in uh, services given out in the community. TANF is over eight, 800 cases with one and a half million services given out in the community. Both those programs, SNAP and TANF and Medicaid, um, basically we haven't had any interviews as far as those things, the interviews have been waived. 
So um, recipients don't need to have a face-to-face -face or a phone interview. Also, they have increased assistance in those programs. Uh, SNAP actually, they get emergency allotments each month, and that has been since the first of last year, where they everyone's household who's eligible gets the maximum amount of food stamps for that household or SNAP assistance. Also with SNAP, as far as if they have children, school-aged children in the household, they get additional benefits uh, to replace the free lunches and free uh, breakfasts that uh, basically they could have been eligible for. So anyone with school-aged children, and if they're receiving SNAP, get those additional uh, benefits for their school-aged children. TANF increases, they have had emergency assistance for TANF as far as to increase that household, which is what, what you would have considered the welfare check in the past. So additional monies are coming into those households who receive TANF. Our energy assistance program, which consists of fuel, cooling, and crisis assistance is over 1 million in assistance. And those are about 3,000 cases. And those cases have gotten additional uh, benefits also, emergency assistance for, for cooling assistance this past year. So um, all in all, our cases have increased. And basically, um, you know, we are able to keep assistance and, and families uh, provided with those benefits. And we've done very well with the state there. We've even been awarded uh, some accommodations as far as for um, no errors as far as in we're one of the biggest localities and we've, we've gotten a, a accommodation for no errors as far as on some of our programs. Uh, we've been timely processing and basically just getting the, in, the benefits out to the community. So I'm very proud of our staff and what they've been able to do. Uh, Lisa has some information on services that she's gonna present. Yes, thank you, and thank you, and good evening to everyone. Um, I wanted just to run through some of our service programs and kind of what the impact has been this year, so the things that have been different. Uh, we have our adult protective services and our adult services programs, and we have seen um, this year a significant increase in the number of referrals that we have gotten um, for our adults, as well as an increase in the cases that we have opened and investigated uh, for abuse, neglect, um, financial exploitation. And the, the high number of self-neglect cases has been uh, really significant this year. Because if you think about the programs that deliver meals, like Meals on Wheels and other things to our elderly or disabled populations, um, these programs stopped um, completely. Uh, for um, quite some time. And so our workers were doing a lot of um, those kinds of investigations of, because some of our elderly populations just weren't getting the food that they needed. And so a lot of food deliveries and things of that nature were happening um, early um, in the, or late in the spring, early in the summer to try to um, help our clients um, meet those needs. Um, so that has been significant. We've also seen, um, as usual, an increase in our financial exploitation cases. Um, child Protective Services, on the other hand, so um, with our, our, our children, uh, we had saw a significant decrease in the number of referrals that we were getting for abuse and neglect cases, which um, uh, send, sends us a little bit in a panic because we're wondering, you know, where are those children and what, what's going on with them? But if you think our um, children, um, our biggest referral source is through our schools and our community providers, um, and those weren't operating. So um, we, you know, had some worries. But um, what we have found is even though our referrals have decreased for Child Protective Services for that last part of the year, the amount of cases that we were opening, the percentage, remained fairly stable. So I still think that we were um, getting the calls on those most severe um, situations of abuse and neglect, and we were able to address those um, as they come in. And so that, and, and of course, numbers now are getting back to um, normal. Um, and we you know, really want to hear about those situations, and we really want to be able to address them in the community. Um, for our foster care and adoptions, 
Um, we did have a slight decrease this year or this past year over um, in the number of children that have come into foster care. And that kind of coincides with numbers um, with CPS, the referrals going down. So the number of foster children going down as well for a time. Um, and this is a statewide trend. This is not just something that's happening in Stanton. It is um, something that's happening across the state. But those numbers are picking up as our courts you know, open and, and we're having those um, things happen. The number of adoptions went down a little bit as well. I will say there are a number of approved foster families um, in the community. We had an increase, which is a, a really good thing. Um, the outreach that we were able to do with our community um, online um, through trainings and recruitment efforts, um, it, the, the pandemic didn't affect that. And people were, if anything, more willing to reach out and um, lend help and um, become foster parents. So that was, um, that was a, that's a highlight. Um, our Children's Services Act, which isn't technically DSS, but we are the fiscal agent for that. We did see a slight decrease um, in the number of children served, you'll see in the report, um, not, not a huge decrease. There's never huge decreases for those funding uh, services for children, but we, we did see that and um, we are carrying that through with our um, local budget this year, um, that slight decrease. So, um, so we're watching those numbers very closely and making sure that you know, the children in the community are getting the services that they need. So if you think of the, the service workers that we have, all that work is done in the community, in the homes, and um, yeah, we're, our, our workers are out in, in, in the homes of um, people in this community and across the state to visit our, the children that we have in care. So all that came to kind of a screeching halt. Um, so the worry and concern and the stress level of those workers, of the families that we were there trying to support, you know, really, really rose for um, a, a long time. Um, the state enabled us to um, do some visits virtual, um, but if you can imagine if you have a child who's in foster care trying to do a virtual visit with a three-year-old on the other end, it doesn't promote a lot of um, uh, progress toward reunification. So we saw some of those things being barriers, but um, for the safety of our workers and the safety of all involved, we were able to take advantage of some virtual uh, visits, um, home visits, and uh, we're able to do that for some time. Um, of course, for emergencies, for adults and CPS, we were still going out in the community, still going into those homes when we had to go, um, and the workers did very well with it. Um, in September, uh, we were given notice that we were no longer allowed to do virtual visits unless there was a specific COVID reason. So the workers are back fully out in the community, in the homes, visiting and um, investigating reports of abuse and neglect wherever um, you know, we are called to do so, um, as long as there's not a specific COVID reason. And, and really the workers were glad to be back. They are glad to see the children face to face. Um, it makes their job a lot easier and they feel more confident that we're meeting the needs of the, the families in our community. Um, so I think, I think that's it. That's all I have. I appreciate um, um, y'all listening um, in and taking a look at our annual report. Um, Anita, do you have anything else to add? No, as far as basic. Were there any questions? Yeah, thank you, Lisa. And um, yes, if there's any questions, we'll be glad to answer anything we can. Are there any questions? Um, Council Member Holmes. I'm just wondering, do you have any idea what percentage of increase you had this year so far? It's just in, the, in over, overall outlays. Well, the increase in benefit programs, this would be your SNAP, TANF, and Medicaid, is about a 2%. That was from uh, July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2020. I would say our, our Medicaid cases have definitely increased just because we're, we haven't been... Um, able to close any of those cases. They have continued growing over this past year. Is that because you can't visit them or, or, or personally or? 
with uh, with Medicaid cases, it's a public. It's uh, through the the state is a public health emergency, so we're not able to close those unless the person requests closure. They move from the locality or death. Any additional questions or comments? Mayor Oaks, Council Member Mead. Thank you. I, I just want to say I, when I look at the benefits and, uh, and programs that you all administer, that you save lives every day. And I just want to thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Harris, I do have a question. Um, would you be willing to explain TANF funds as simply as you can for the benefit of our listeners? Sure. Um, TANF is Temporary Assistance to Needy Families. It used to be what was called the welfare check years ago, as far as that that's a monthly uh, check or a monthly benefit, a financial benefit that they would get each, each month. Right now it comes on a debit card that they receive and they can use that for, um, you know, paying bills, uh, buying household products or whatever, um, even buying food if they want to. But um, basically, it's based on no income in the household. And they have to have minor children in the household also. Right. Thank you. I have to yeah, say your, your um, annual report, it was well done. And it's an easy read. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you for um, being patient with our technology. You're right. Technology is great when it works. <laughs> so <laughs> sure. thank you for being here this evening. Glad to. Thank you. And our numbers are all located on that eight, that annual report on the yeah. back. So if you need to call us or have a question or, or an inquiry of any kind, please let us know. We'll be glad to assist. All right. We've got it. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, Thank you ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good evening. All right. The next item on the agenda is item C, an annual report of Blue Ridge Court Service. Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Megan Roan, the Director of Blue Ridge Court Services. Hi, welcome. Hello. Thank you for making time for me on the agenda. <laughs> yes, so that is a hard copy of the annual report. I've also provided a PowerPoint presentation that you probably also have. We do. Thank you. So let me start out. I'm going to kind of follow Anita and tell you a little bit how we adjusted um, to COVID in our office. Um, I will say we didn't skip a beat. Um, I would like to thank City Council, the leadership team um, with the City of Stanton, the IT department. Um, we just didn't miss a beat. So I would like to thank everyone for their guidance. Um, we are still currently doing staggered schedules in our office as far as staff. Um, we have half the staff working at one time and then the other half throughout that way. If half the staff at any point would have needed to quarantine that the other half would still be able to provide services and report to court. So we are still maintaining that right now. Um, we have continued to meet with our clients the entire time. Um, we have done a lot of outdoor um, client contacts. We have actually conducted a lot of oral swab screens um, uh, outdoors over DoxyMe or WebEx. Same with um, even during the court closures. We felt like this was such a vulnerable time for our clients as far as regressing or falling back into old habits as far as um, relapsing on drugs. So we felt like it was just crucial that we kept um, everything, you know, steady. So even with drug court, we continued drug court through WebEx um, so that we were still able to get everyone together. And we also did the same for therapeutic docket. Um, so we have just, that's kind of just to give you an idea as to how we have maintained. Again, we have just kept going. We haven't missed any client contacts. Um, and so I will just go right into our annual report. And as I go through and talk about the numbers, I will try to tell you where I, I feel like COVID has, has affected our numbers. I will jump in and say that. Um, and I know you've heard this before, but for um, those listening in the public, let me just say 
that our mission at Blue Ridge Court Services um, is to provide sentencing alternatives um, to the entire local criminal justice system in an effort to one, reduce jail overcrowding, two, enhance public safety, and also to offer rehabilitative opportunities. And those services are offered to, of course, the city of Stanton, but also Waynesboro, Lexington, Buena Vista, and the counties of Augusta, Rockbridge, and Highland. So just some highlights of 2020. Um, as far as lo local probation services, again, we had about 2,300 clients this year total. Um, for local probation services, we had 831 um, new probation placements. That was actually down from 2019. It was down about 109 placements. We contribute that to, to the court closures. Um, so there was a period of time where we actually weren't receiving probation placements at all. Um, now, when you look at our average um, daily caseloads, that didn't go down because we are keeping um, folks longer because we weren't closing out cases during that time either. So just to kind of give you an idea there. Pretrial services. Um, we had 1,016 pretrial placements. Pretrial was up this year, of course. Um, where probation numbers went down slightly, pretrial numbers went up. Um, again, we actually contribute that to, to COVID. Um, um, folks being placed on pretrial supervision. Domestic violence, we had 173 placements. A reentry program, we served 208 participants. Pretrial initiative on mental illness, 213. Home electronic monitoring, 71. Therapeutic docket, 21. And drug court, 30. Now I'll kind of break that down for you a little bit. Again, um, in FY 2020, as I said, we had 831 probation placements and that was down a little bit. Um, we had 678 misdemeanor cases and 153 felony cases. We mainly serve the misdemeanor population. Um, so we mainly serve folks that if they served a sentence or if they violated their probation, they would serve that time in Middle River. Um, the felony cases that we receive um, are mainly first offender cases. For example, a first offender possession of schedule one or two would come under our supervision. Um, the average daily cost of probation supervision in 2020 is about $1.40 as compared to the average daily cost of a jail bed at $85.83. So if I break down probation placements for you by jurisdiction, 25% of the probation placements um, came from Stanton, 42% of our probation placements were from Augusta, 22% from Waynesboro, 7% from Rockbridge, Lexington, and 2% from Buena Vista. Our re-entry services, I say this every year, this is one of my favorites. Um, we receive a grant from CAPSOL, Coordinated Area um, Partnership with Stanton Augusta Waynesboro. And this is actually a great service. Everyone that comes through Blue Ridge Court Services, we have re-entry referral forms. So anybody that is in need of a resume, let me start out by saying so many folks are referred to us. And actually on the orders, it will say to maintain employment. Well, so many folks come to us that haven't had a job, don't have proper attire to interview, um, don't know how to answer questions at an interview. So this money provides us the opportunity to try to um, provide those folks with those services. So we serve 208 reentry clients. Um, 83 clients were provided assistance in obtaining employment. Um, for those folks, if they didn't have a resume, we would sit down with them and help them develop a resume. We have a reentry coordinator um, because we received this funding that's able to sit down and help them develop that resume, apply for jobs online. Um, we have um, a partnership with the Valley Mission that um, we can give them a voucher for clothing that they can take to the thrift store. Um, and that way they can have a suit or proper attire to go to an interview. Um, 79 clients received transportation assistance. 
Um, right now, public transportation has been free during COVID, but normally we have tokens in the office. Transportation is just a huge issue for so many of our clients. So we provide tokens to them for free um, to get them to and from our office, to and from treatment um, at Valley Community Services Board or wherever they're receiving treatment. 26 self-care kits were distributed to clients. Our self-care kits um, are just for basic needs. We have folks come in that uh, don't have shampoo or a toothbrush or toothpaste. So we have a male self-care kit and a female self-care kit. Um, they're in a black drawstring bag, so it's not obvious you know, what they're walking out of our office with. Um, but we just have a little note that says, please let your officer know if you're in need of this. Um, during COVID, we also applied um, to CAPSAW for funding so that we could provide COVID care kits for our clients. So we also received funding from CAPSAW for that, which was great. We were able to provide masks, hand sanitizer, you know, all the necessities um, that folks needed um, to be safe during COVID. Um, 24 clients were assisted in obtaining safe temporary shelter and 17 clients received reduced cost mental health care. Pre-trial services. Um, again, we received 1,016 pre-trial placements. Um, pre-trial placements were up by 142. We performed 842 pre-trial investigations at the jail. That's another thing that has changed during COVID. Um, the jail worked with us so that we were able to VPN so that we could receive a list of um, folks that, that had been arrested so that we could run records and still provide at least something for the court um, that they could work off of. Um, let's see here. Pretrial services. There's an 87% program success rate, 96% appearance rate, 93% public safety rate, and the average daily cost of pretrial supervision is about $1.93 as compared to the jail cost of $85.83. Pretrial services by jurisdiction, 42% of our cases were out of Augusta, 26% from Stanton, 18% from Waynesboro, 10% from Rockbridge, Lexington, and 4% from Buena Vista. We also have a pretrial initiative on mental illness. Um, in 2020, 213 individuals were referred to this program. Um, and this is to try to catch folks with mental illness on the front end. Um, everyone that goes into Middle River Regional Jail is given a brief jail mental health screen. And again, that just helps to be able to capture um, folks that are in need of the mental health services on the front end. We actually have um, a pretrial officer that handles our mental health caseload. Domestic violence, we had 173 domestic violence referrals um, 75 of those placements were from Augusta, 52 placements from Stanton, 33 placements from Waynesboro, and 11 placements from Rockbridge, Lexington. 84% of those cases successfully completed their court-ordered obligations. Um, folks that come to us, we do risk assessments on everyone to figure out their needs and what we need to address while they're under our supervision. So folks that come through our domestic violence program, um, most of these individuals would either go through an anger management program or batteries and intervention program, depending on what their past looks like and what the assessment um, shows for them. We have continued with all of our in-house groups and individual therapy sessions. Again, it just looks a little different now. Um, either they are using a virtual platform or a lot of individual counseling sessions have also been held over the phone. But again, this was just a critical time for our clients. So we even picked up those services for more individual counseling during that time. Therapeutic docket program. Um, we received 21 new placements. We had seven graduates in 2020. Um, nine of those placements were from Stanton Courts. We had nine from Augusta County, three from Waynesboro. Therapeutic docket, again, we continued um, through COVID. We just met on virtual platforms. Drug court. 
So this program, Therapeutic Docket, let me go back and say, that is our specialized docket for folks that come to us. A lot of those start out in the PIMI program, the Pretrial Initiative on Mental Illness. And these are folks that a lot of times um, they come to us because there's an underlying mental health issue that may be part of the cause of them breaking the law. So therapeutic docket, we are able to get them in, get them stabilized on medication, get them in services um, so that they're at the point where they can be gainfully employed. And they go before the judge two times a month. And so that is one of our specialized dockets. Drug court is our other specialized docket. Um, so this program targets individuals who have been, been involved in criminal activity arising from their addiction to alcohol or illegal drugs. It was our 19th year of operation, a total of 217 participants and 95 graduates since inception in 2002. I will say since this was done, we actually had our 100th graduate um, just recently and we actually did that over a virtual platform. So that was super exciting for drug court. Um, four graduates in 2020. Um, drug court, I would say, drug court and therapeutic docket, I say this again every year too. Um, those are two of my favorites also. It is just amazing to see people walk into these programs on the front end and then to see how they are when they graduate the programs. Um, you just can't help but to be moved. You read their letters and it is so moving how far they've come. They do this. We just walk by their side and assist them through the program. But it is amazing what these individuals accomplish. Um, our home electronic monitoring program. Of course, due to COVID, our placements for HEM, um, we had 71 home electronic monitoring placements for FY 2020. Um, so this is a great program for certain individuals that are able to keep their jobs, support their families, um, and that also saves jail beds for higher risk individuals. So these are the individuals, again, that are able to continue to work um, and support their families. If you look down through the localities, the number of participants, um, we had 23 participants from Stanton in FY 2020, 27 from Augusta, seven from Waynesboro, six from Rockbridge, Lexington, one from Buena Vista, and seven from other jurisdictions. So if you look at the bed days saved, 8,733. So um, that would be the home electronic monitoring program. So if you look at our finances, again, the city of Stanton serves as our fiscal agent, but we are grant funded. So the Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services um, is, and I'm getting ready to present on that grant coming up, that's our largest funding source for probation and pretrial services. Um, the Virginia Supreme Court um, provides funding for our drug court and our therapeutic docket. Augusta Health provides funding for our groups and individual therapy. So that's, that's another great resource there. CAPSAW, um, I've already said, provides funding for our reentry program. The Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services um, for our PIMI program, the Pretrial Initiative on Mental Illness. And we also do have participant fees, and that includes our supervision fees uh, for our probation clients and the home electronic monitoring fees. We do rent that equipment, so we do expect them to pay for that equipment when they are on home electronic monitoring with us. And so down below, you can see the percentage of where that funding comes from. 60% of our funding comes from the Department of Criminal Justice Services. Any questions for me regarding the FY 2020 annual report? Okay. Any questions by council members? Madam Mayor. Council Member Darby. I, I don't have any questions. I would just like to thank you for this information. 
And it's really good uh, for everyone to know, you know, the good work that you're doing for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Holmes. Oh, how, how do you, uh, a lot of these people, do they have computers and are able to, to uh, converse with you through Zoom or some other type thing? They are. Um, and actually, um, you'll see in the hard copy of the annual report, we have actually, we received a grant to receive devices for our folks that actually don't have devices. We are actually still waiting on those to come in. Um, they are on back order. So that will help significantly for those that don't have access. However, we did um, create a little makeshift stand out in our lobby and we put a surface out there so that folks could still come in and social distance, but still be able to interact with the judge. Um, and individual counseling and groups, they have been great as far as working with folks that they can just complete this using their phone. Any additional questions or comments? It's a great neighbor. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would like to say the more we can support you all, the lower the numbers can go down as far as inmates at Middle River Regional Jail. There we go. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all very much. much. Very thank well you. done. Thank you. All right. The next item is item D, a discussion and consideration of grant application to Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services for FY 2022 Comprehensive Community Corrections Act for local Responsible Offenders and the Pre-Trial Service Act. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, Ms. Roan will stay with us just a bit longer to present this item. Right. Welcome back. Well, thank you. So you've just heard what this would fund. The only thing, this is actually a continuation grant. So this is something that we apply for um, on an annual basis. Let me just tell you the difference this year. We have actually received extra funding for pretrial expansion in Rockbridge, Lexington, and Buena Vista. So we do have additional funding that we will be applying for um, for FY 2022. So that would be the only difference in this continuation grant. Right. Are there any questions? All right. Thank you. Thank hearing, you. hearing no questions, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Council Member Clappy. Me. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> Mr. Roberts. <laughs> Vice Mayor uh, Robertson. Sorry. I move that City Council authorize staff to apply to the Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services for a grant to fund local probation and pretrial services. Madam Mayor. <laughs> Council Member Clappy. I'd like to second. Thank you. So we have a motion on the floor and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes? Aye. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Ms. Dull? Aye. Ms. Darby? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you all very much. Appreciate everything you did. Thank you. All right. So the next item on the agenda is a discussion and consideration of Virginia Commission for the Arts 2021 through 2022 Creative Communities Partnership Grant Application. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, Mr. Rhodes will present this item. Welcome back, Mr. Rhodes. Thank you, Mayor Oaks, City Council members. Um, tonight, we're requesting um, Council's authorization for staff to apply for a grant from the Virginia Commission for the Arts for 2021 to 2022, their Creative Communities Partnership Grant. Um, I look back through the records I have on file, and this is an application that the city has applied for and has received since at least 2003. I think it may go back into the, into the 90s also. Um, and this is a, um, a grant, it um, requires a match, an equal match. And in the past, um, these funds have been distributed to three arts organizations in the city, Shannon Arts, the Stonewall Brigade Band and the Stanton Augusta Art, Art Center. Um, they've been um, uh, equally distributed among those three organizations. And staff proposes to apply once again. 
the application deadline is April 1st. And uh, it'd be the same three organizations that would receive the funding. As I noted, this is a, a match. So uh, the, the maximum that we can apply for is $4,500. So that would be the match that the city would come up with. Uh, I've talked to Mr. Phil Trayer, and as of this time, it is in the draft um, budget for next year. Okay. However, if through your deliberations, if this is um, removed from the city's budget, you're not on the hook to, to pay this match. And also, if, uh, if we receive funding less than this $4,500, the city would only be responsible for matching half of it. Perfect example, about three years ago, the, um, the advertised amount was 5,000, but they only um, issued $4,500. So the city had, you know, paid $4,500 also. And unfortunately it has stayed at that level ever since then. Um, I would note that I believe we have representatives from all three arts organizations that have patiently waited on the Zoom platform. They are Donald Dollins from Stonewall Brigade Band, Michael Connor from Center Arts, and Bridget Cohen from Stanton Augusta Arts Center. And um, the mayor may want to see if they have any comments at this time. They are certainly here uh, to take any questions that um, council has. Absolutely. Uh, would anyone care to address the council? Uh, how about Michael. questions? Okay. I would not miss an opportunity to address the council. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Welcome. I enjoy that. Uh, unfortunately, there, Mr. Rhodes has spoke of uh, the grant in some negative terms and, and given some negative instruction in that uh, if the amounts don't come, uh, I would like to pose it in the other direction in that if there are extra funds available, certainly all three organizations would be open to receiving more. Uh, so if in your budgeting process, you can make that possible. Uh, that would be a good thing for all of us. We'll keep that in mind. <laughs> all right, are there any questions by council members? All right, would anyone else care to address the council? All right, hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Council Member Holmes. Oh, uh, doesn't matter. Oh, go ahead, Terry. Okay, I move the city council authorize staff to apply for the 2021-2022 Creative Community Partnership Grant with the understanding that acceptance will be determined by the availability of local funds to match that grant. I second. All right, so we have a motion on the floor. We have a second by Council Member Darby. Any further discussion, Mr. Rosenberg? Madam Mayor, I just noticed, I believe Ms. Cowan may have had some comments that she wanted to make. Okay, all right. Um, <laughs> please go right ahead. <laughs> I was muted um, when I tried to speak. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, the city in the past uh, for, um, for supporting the uh, Stanton Augusta Arts Center. And uh, we are very dependent on these uh, kinds of grants uh, for our survival, especially in a pandemic year. So we hope that you will be generous again in the upcoming year. So thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, we certainly appreciate all three of the um, various arts um, that have been presented tonight. So thank you for what all you do. All right, any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. All right, the next item is item F, which is a letter to the Virginia governor supporting an amendment to Senate Bill 1157 mandating a change in local elections from May to November to allow localities until November 30th, 2024 to comply with the legislation. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor and members of council, as you all are aware, the general acted legislation that would require localities in Virginia with May elections to shift those elections to November. Uh, the, the legislation is on the governor's desk awaiting his review and signature. 
both the Virginia Municipal League and Virginia First Cities have um, sought to convince the governor to amend, to propose an amendment to the uh, enacted legislation that would allow localities until November 30th of 2024 to comply with the requirement of the legislation to shift from May to November. And so the question before council this evening is whether it would like to have the city send a letter to the governor supporting what I would refer to as a deferred implementation date. Thank you. All right. Are there any questions for Mr. Rosenberg? Are there any comments? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I would move that the city manager be authorized and directed to prepare and send to Governor Northam a letter supporting an amendment to Senate Bill 1157, mandating a change in local elections from May to November to allow localities until November 30th, 2024 to comply with the legislation. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Council Member Darby. I will second that. We have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Ms. Mead. No. Ms. Dull. No. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Mr. Holmes. No. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. So the next item is matters from the city manager, Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of council, I have one item for you this evening. Before I present that item, let me remind the public that the following item on the agenda is matters from the public. And if any member of the public would like to participate and address council, now would be a good time to call the number to be placed in the queue. That number is 844-854-2222. And when prompted, enter the access code for the meeting, 619-358-POUND. Uh, the one item I have for council members as reported to you in the monthly report that was sent to you yesterday, and perhaps some of you have already had a chance to review that report, uh, the city has been recognized for the 25th year in a row as a Tree City USA. And the uh, Tree City USA is a program of the Arbor Day Foundation. And uh, in order to qualify for this award, uh, a locality has to satisfy four basic requirements, including a what they refer to as a tree board or department, which in this case is our parks and rec department with the, the landscape advisory mm -hmm. committee. Yep. Secondly, a tree care ordinance. Thirdly, a community forestry program with an annual budget of at least $2 per capita. And then finally, an Arbor Day proclamation and observance, which of course we hold here in Stanton annually. So uh, our city horticulturalist, Matt Sensabaugh, shared this information with me uh, just over a week or so ago and asked me to share it with council. And I'm, I'm pleased to do so and to publicly express my appreciation to Matt and other members of the parks and recreation staff for the good work that they do year after year uh, that, that brings this sort of recognition to the city. Thank you. Absolutely. Congratulations. And we thank everyone involved. All right. The next item is matters from the public. Um, this part of city council's agenda is entitled matters from the public. It is a time that council sets aside to hear from citizens and others about a wide variety of subjects. Before we begin, I'd like to share five basic ground rules that we ask you to respect as you make your remarks. One, please come to the podium, identify yourself, 
and complete your remarks within five minutes. The mayor will let you know when you've reached your five minutes. So we ask that you please give your name, your address, and then keep your remarks at five minutes or less. Two, this is the time for us as a council simply to listen to your remarks. In an effort to encourage and maintain orderly conduct, we will not engage in give and take debate. If you are seeking information, you may mention it during your remarks and the city manager or his staff may get in touch with you in the days ahead. Three, we ask that you direct your comments to council as a whole and not to identify members of council or to identify individual employees of the city. If you want to take up an issue with an individual member of council or an employee, please speak with us before or after the meeting. We are also accessible by phone, mail, or email. Again, we ask that you direct your comments to the council as a whole. Four, we expect every speaker to be civil and courteous. Using profanity, making personal attacks on an individual, and doing anything that is disruptive to the order of conduct of this meeting will not be tolerated. Five, finally, as the presiding officer, it is my duty to remind you that if you choose not to abide by these ground rules, I may find that you are out of order and will ask you to withdraw from the podium. We certainly do not want to reach that point and even beyond. So we respectfully ask for your full cooperation in observing these guidelines. When you reach five minutes, I will let you know. If you continue to speak, I will ask you to step away from the podium. And a third time, I will ask you to please step, to please stop speaking and step away from the podium. Otherwise, you may be charged with disorderly conduct under Virginia Code Section 18.2-415A2. If you wish, you may obtain a copy of the ground rules from our Clerk of Council, Ms. Simmons. And now, we welcome all speakers. The podium is now avail available for matters from the public. I will um, entertain speakers from the public and the audience first, and then we'll um, take callers from the Zoom. All right, welcome. Thank you, my name is Rusty Ashby. I live at 917 Palatan Street, Stanton, Virginia. I can take this off when I'm talking, right? Yes. Okay. And you have the sanitizing wipes if you need them. A couple things I came here to, to address tonight. One of them is very simple. I talked to several people and because of some of the controversial type meetings and so many speakers, we think it'd be a good idea if you all consider changing public comments to three minutes versus the five thinking most things can be said in three minutes. Okay, so <clears throat> second thing I want to do is paying attention to a lot of things. I remember a saying, and I'm sure all of you've heard this when you were children, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never harm me. Well, you know, everything changes in life. Uh, just as we heard someone earlier said, uh, 1890 something, it's not the same Republican party. Well, it's not the same Democratic party. Really the only thing the same now is God is in control. Everything has changed. And so I thought this ch children's uh, nursery rhyme needs to be changed to today's world. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never harm me unless printed in the paper. <laughs> The second thing is recently Bruce uh, Helder passed away, as we all know, and there was a lot of good, positive, loving comments about Bruce. Anybody know, knew him, uh, knows all those things were true. And it made me start thinking, the older you get, you think like this. Something happens to one of you all, what's going to be in the paper? Things like that, or is it going to be resisted everything I could? I didn't attend the meetings uh, like I should have. Uh, I called the mayor and somebody else a racist, which is a lie and should never be allowed to be said in, the, in these uh, surroundings. Um, or they're going to say things that you try to bring people together. Did you work together, try to make things better than what they were? And I would ask you, when the five here at least, when you decide to run for office, what, what did you want to accomplish? Did you want to spend so much time dealing with the uh, FOIA or uh, not being invited to things or you're a racist or do you want to do certain things like, I don't know if you ever thought about these, but, and I'm not an internet person, but I thought, hmm, I wonder if there's something on the internet that talks about being a city council person and there is. 
does he even understand city council? First one says the Stanton City Council comprises seven members who are elected by city voters and empowered by the city charter and the code of Virginia with the responsibility of establishing laws in the city, adopting an annual budget, setting tax levels to fund maintenance of the city infrastructure, schools, public safety. That should be the majority of your time. Now, and I thought, well, that's just not really telling me enough. But I did think of these things, the one thing I'd be interested in, because I get really upset about this FOIA thing, is how much money and time has been spent on unnecessary areas like that that could have been spent, because Stanton needs a lot of management. And that's, all, that's your responsibility. But I dug a little further, and here's what I was looking for. An effective council member is respectful, polite, and differential towards all to fellow council members, staff, and the public, regardless of likes, dislikes, friendships, politics, he or she doesn't insult, attack, or demand. I would just ask that the city council try to take that under advisement, all seven of you, because I hear people say, I'm really embarrassed by our council today. A lot of my friends are saying that. I'm not just embarrassed, I'm embarrassed, I am disgusted with some of the things that are going on here. You're elected to high position. When you get things in the mail, it says to the honorable, be honorable and quit attacking each other and saying things just to get somebody off course. Pay attention to the needs of this city, address them. You can do it if you get off your, your pedestals and do what you were chartered or voted elected to do. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. 28 seconds left. <laughs> Would anyone else like to address the council? Welcome. Hello. My name is Deborah Kushner. I live at 1311 North Augusta Street. Several of you toured the mountain, the MRRJ today. Of course, you saw crowded conditions. The jail has been overcrowded for years because it's economically advantageous to rent out beds to other jails. If you consider the hard statistics that Stanton's incarceration rates are more than double the national average, if you consider the staggering 70% recidivism rate, and if you look at the proportion of black to white people in a jail, it's clear that the real needs are anti-racism education for law enforcement, medical and behavioral treatment for those who need it, as a viable option to incarceration. Diversion programs, treatment for alcohol and substance abuse issues, issues, mental health treatment, and ending the cash bail poor people's tax are all investments in people's safety and lives. I trust that you all value human lives because they're but for the grace of genetics, income, race, mental and or substance abuse disorders, go I, and you, and all of us. You toured the jail today and saw what the jail wanted you to see. But did you speak with anyone incarcerated there? How will you understand the experience of the hum human beings who are housed there? And how will you grasp what it's like for citizens of your community without the means to make bail or have the option to make taxpayers pay for their lawyer friend's fees or recre recreate at a golf course enjoy enjoying shiny new golf carts? How will you listen to the many citizens who are morally offended by your many closed committee meetings, fabricated rules for speaking here and calling for extra guards in this chamber as soon as you were elected and even still when you don't like what's being said? This jail does not have a stellar history. I've heard firsthand accounts of withheld medications, abuse and neglect. I've seen documented complaints of spoiled food rocks and food that break and chip teeth, food trays with old food still on it, lawsuits citing excessive force. This council should reflect on the environment that you create. How well do you safeguard the citizenry by modeling proper mask wearing or recognizing the need for electronic meetings one year ago? How welcoming an environment do you create by openly bullying and ridiculing fellow council members, as well as the citizens you swore to serve. It takes increasing courage for citizens to speak out in the hostile environment you've created here and by your refusal to shut down bullying comments by callers. 
I urge you all to check your privilege, recognize it, adopt some humility, listen and learn from those in our midst who in seven months of this administration, you haven't served yet. The highest proportion, sorry, the highest percentage of deaths in jail is due to suicide. Try to process that utter horrible despair that statistic represents. We don't need a bigger jail. We and you need more compassion. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Welcome. Good evening. Good to see you all here. My name is Travis Smiley, and I live here in Stanton. Uh, I got a few topics I want to talk to you about. Um, but first, I want to thank the five of you who are here in person, uh, respecting the office for which you are elected to by us, the people of Stanton. So again, thank you all. I also want to thank you, the, f the seven of you, for investing in the future of the Gypsy Hill Golf Course. Uh, I'm happy that all of us here in the city may continue to use the course thanks to the purchase of new golf carts. Uh, the game of golf and the course itself had a great year this year. I mean, despite everything that's happened, uh, the game improved due to interest as it's one of the only sports that we can all engage in during the pandemic. Um, I know personally, I can't wait for the weather to turn so I can get out to Gypsy Hill and test drive some new carts. Um, but, you know, with all due respect to the other courses in town, Gypsy Hill offers the best value uh, that we have. And uh, I look forward to doing my part to uh, give the city a return on its investment in these new carts. Secondly, I want to talk about Middle River Regional Jail. I'm happy to learn that the five of you here tonight went and toured the facility today to see for yourselves the dire circumstances that necessitate an expansion of the facility. From my own conversation with Superintendent Newton, I know that you discovered the facility is currently operating at nearly 250% of its Virginia Department of Corrections rated capacity. Um, that's a problem for obvious reasons. It's, it creates some inhumane conditions. Now that is not due to the existence of the jail, that is due to the circumstances in which we live uh, under the pandemic. Um, so it, it's a bottleneck effect created by the inmate transfer, fee, transfer freeze imposed by our governor for those who are unaware. Uh, Middle River currently houses nearly 400 Virginia DOC inmates who are awaiting transfer to state facilities as a result of the bottleneck. And to put that in perspective for everyone who was not on the tour today or who has not spoken to the superintendent, our regional jail is being forced to house more of the Commonwealth's inmates than the facility has capacity for, in addition to its own inmates. I know many oppose the expansion under the false guise of the prison for profit system, as if additional space at a facility will somehow create more criminals rather than meet the needs of the current inmate population, which you all saw today. I know your visit to Middle River showed you the truth of the matter. I encourage the members who opted out of the tour to consider the experiences of those who did attend. I'm also pleased that the expansion will address mental and behavioral health services to the inmates who oftentimes are the most in need of such care. Expanding the facility is the humane and necessary decision. I'm glad to announce that, you know, the budget for the state of Virginia, the final budget came out this afternoon and my boss was the patron of the language that is included in the final budget for the state to reimburse the Middle River Regional Jail Authority 25% of the construction cost if the authority approves the, the expansion. So thank you all for your tour today and for uh, realizing all that. Mm. Next, um, I'm thankful that you all approved this evening sending a letter to Governor Northam urging him to delay the enactment of moving local elections to November. While we may all disagree about the reasons for electing local bodies separately from state and national level representatives, I think we can all agree that our city and, and cities across the Commonwealth need more time to make the necessary charter and organizational changes to adhere to the soon to be law, uh, especially considering the current law would require Stanton to propose changes to its charter for the next General Assembly session in less than a year's time. Lastly, Madam Mayor, I'm happy that you specifically were justly found innocent on the frivolous charge of willfully and maliciously withholding information pursuant to a FOIA request of an ordinary citizen of Stanton. 
This ordinary citizen refused to let the lawsuit go, even though she had the paperwork that she requested, that the judge asked her to move on. Instead, this ordinary citizen proceeded with her case, costing taxpayers of the city more than $7,000. That this ordinary citizen could not put her personal grudge against you aside, something the judge in the case specifically indicated she believed was the true motive, is a perfect encapsulation of this ordinary citizen's actions in her official capacity on this council. Thankfully, the judge's determination that this ordinary citizen was not suing you in her official capacity as a member of the body means the city's insurance will cover the cost to reimburse the city. I'm happy to see the members who refused to physically attend the council meetings are finally appearing in front of the body, albeit virtually. The physical presence of all members your, of these meetings is up. would have you. meant avoiding this FOIA fiasco your, altogether. Your time is up. Thank you. Thank you to those of you who properly attend these meetings. Would anyone else from the public uh, in the attendance tonight like to speak? All right, hearing none, Mr. Rosenberg. Yes, Madam Mayor, it appears we have a few callers on the line. First caller. Is the caller on the line? Yes. Please state your name and address and address your Ready comments to council. Okay, uh, my name's Tim and I live in Stanton, Virginia. Um, I'd like to say good evening to Stanton City Council. Y'all do such a great job. I want to say to the city, the citizens of Stanton, I am tired of reading about y'all trashing Miss Oaks and the City Council in the Stanton paper every Sunday. They do a great job. Two, I think we need to change the voter registration laws here in Virginia. We need to change it to have them vote instead of age 18, change it to age 21. We should not allow the immigrants that are coming over here now illegally to vote at all. And also, I want to say I've heard some people at the last meeting talk about the golf carts. Have any of y'all, the people who are saying Gypsy Hill does not need golf carts, have any of y'all heard of Tiger Woods, the greatest golfer ever? All these golf courses in this area, Gypsy Hill, Ironwood, Ingleside, and Heritage Oaks, all of them are open to the public. If there wasn't a golf course around here, Tiger Woods would not be the greatest golfer that he is today because he wouldn't have a place to go play. And also, Dale Curry and Seth Curry, they play golf too. So I'd just like to say, I think we need the golf carts in Stanton. And I'm like, with Travis Smiley, I am hoping the weather hurry up and turn so we can go out and go play golf. Thank you very much. Y'all have a good day. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller on the line? Hello? Hello? Please state your name and address and address your comments to council. I'm Sheila Motti, College Park, Stanton. Good evening, city council members and citizens of Stanton, Mayor Oaks and council members. I want to address my opposition to an expansion of the Middle River Jail Complex. Jail expansion is a multi-billion dollar enterprise that occurs across the United States from rural to metropolitan areas. But who benefits from the system? Not those jails. It benefits the businesses that contract with jails and correctional systems for modern day free exploited labor much akin to African Americans working in labor camps, better known as plantations during enslavement. It created forced labor for those who did not have a voice for legal rights, the finesse, nor the money to manipulate the judicial system to work for and not against them. They had no adequate work options and sustainable wages, 
no adequate affordable housing, no just standard of educational opportunities to put them on a path to self-sufficiency and no way out of an unjust system of exploitation. Who benefited? The system of profit to the profiteer and none to those forced to, to do manual labor. The system of justice in this country is not based upon justice for everyone, but justice for those who can pay for justice. Justice is not equal and never has been. It disproportionately impacts black, brown, and Latina people. They are greater affected by unequal justice that causes them to sit for weeks and months on end waiting for a court date for many times low-level crimes and no thinking out of the box philosophy to recreate a system that is responsive to mental health, education, substance abuse, employment, and other interconnected needs of those living on the edge. These are the people at Middle River Jail. Our community members can better <coughs> benefit from redirected jail expansion money to viable educational, vocational programs in the jail, quality health and mental health programs, substance abuse treatment and follow-up upon release, and substance transition programs when incarcerated people re-enter the community. These individuals can benefit from sustainable employment options, increased and improved community mental health services, apprenticeship programs in schools that lead students to employment and not to jail, and many other avenues that fund real needs for real people instead of jail expansion and profit to the profiteers. I do believe that people who commit a crime are accountable for their actions. I also know that local government, national government, judicial systems are also accountable for their actions and lack of action to the citizens they take an oath to serve. I really would be interested in seeing the IP services provided to inmates when they leave the jail and exactly what they receive when they're in Middle River Jail. I do believe there are major gaps in these areas. Thank you for allowing me to comment. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller on the line? Yes, this is Mitch Narduzzi from South Jefferson Street, Stanton. It is my understanding that a majority of council members accepted Superintendent Newton's offer to tour the Middle River Regional Jail this week in order to see the issue of overcrowding with their own eyes. While I support learning more to do better, a tour of the jail is simply another tactic that our broken criminal justice system will use to grow itself exponentially. City Council must not use the optics of overcrowding as an excuse to throw $40 million at a problem that will not be solved by building a bigger jail. In the last Blue Ridge Criminal Justice Board meeting, Faye McCauley, the operations specialist at the jail, offered this to say about the current status of the COVID safety protocols at the jail. Quote, we seem to be getting pretty healthy. We have minimal cases. We have a structured process for intake, which has kept the COVID numbers way, way down. And we are beginning this week to do testing again, so we're holding our own, end quote. Yet Superintendent Newton keeps using the dangerous COVID risk of overcrowding as proof that we need an expansion to make things safe. The talking points keep changing, but let's be clear. The jail will never be a safe place for those who are housed there. And overcrowding is not indicative of the need for an expansion. It is the reality of our broken criminal justice system, which is the root of the problem that you, as our leaders, must work to find solutions for above and beyond throwing money at a failed system. I implore you to do your own homework and due diligence in researching why the jail is overcrowded in the first place and not to simply rely on perspectives from singularly focused stakeholders. In a jail, operational capacity refers to the number of inmates a jail can safely hold given factors such as the architectural design of the institution, the capacity of the programs offered, and the number of staff that are running the institution. Overcrowding at Middle River is not disputed, but the solution to crowding is what we need to think about. 
we need to prepare our community members for the likelihood that they will probably hear reports that make it sound like jail overcrowding has suddenly become a crisis that needs an immediate expansion to solve. But the truth is the jail population has hovered around 900 for years, not because the jail is a passive recipient of whoever gets sent there, but because they seem to prefer to keep the population at about 900. And how do we know this? Just for reference, the jail's current population is approximately 839, even though Mayor Oak says that she believed, based on her own visual assessment during her recent tour, that the population numbers were significantly up since she last visit, visited. The data actually shows that in June of 2018, there were 906 inmates at the jail, which included 58 from Page County, who the jail was renting beds to. Page County inmates were not moved out of Middle River until April of 2019. So for months and months, almost a year, Middle River was renting beds to Page County while the average daily population was over 900 and at times even going above 1,000. The service agreement states that they can rent beds to other jurisdictions as space allows. At the time, the jail seemed to think that they have the space to rent beds even with an average daily population of over 900. This just goes to prove if we build it, our current criminal justice system will fill it. Overcrowding is a consequence of failed criminal justice policy, not of rising crime rates, and it undermines the ability of incarceration systems to meet basic human needs such as health care, food, and accommodation. It also compromises the provision and effectiveness of rehabilitation programs, educational and vocational training, and recreational activities. The excessive use of pretrial detention and the use of incarceration for minor petty offenses are critical drivers of incarceration population rates. You must turn your focus to the causes of overcrowding that originate in lack of community-based services and bad criminal justice policy so that our community can develop a strategic solution and not repeat outdated models that waste taxpayer dollars. The Blue Ridge Criminal Justice Board has not even had a discussion about this expansion yet, and, and yet no one from city council has asked them directly to provide advice. The cities of Stanton, Waynesboro, and Augusta County established the Blue Ridge Criminal Justice Board in response to the Comprehensive Community Corrections Act for local responsible offenders and the Pretrial Services Act. The Virginia legislator has placed in the hands of Stanton the means to deal with this problem in our own community. So why have you not Ms. Narducci, your time is up. Your time is up. Okay, Thank you. Thank you. Me. Next caller. Is the caller on the line? Uh, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, please state your name and address and address your comments to council. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Julie Schofield. I live on Lake Avenue here in Stanton, and I have a few comments for uh, council this evening. Um, first, I wanted to share with members of city council that I actually strongly support moving municipal elections to November as soon as possible. And I'm very much um, kind of disturbed that you went ahead and took action on that issue tonight, deciding to write a letter to the governor. And subsequently, I want to let you know that I'm going to be writing a letter to the governor, strongly suggesting it assign the legislation as it's arrived on his desk and that we move as quickly as possible to move all of Virginia's municipal elections to November. You know, Virginia, having lived in Maryland for many years, I came to Virginia and it's exhausting having an election every single year and to have multiple cycles, a May cycle and a November cycle. Um, I think that we really need to focus our attention on having November elections and not confuse voters with these municipal elections and, and, and the off years. It's already expensive, time consuming, and a burden that the state of Virginia uh, taxpayers have to pay uh, for the infrastructure capacity to conduct so many elections um, statewide and at the municipal level. So 
Um, my view is that we need to move our municipal elections to November, and I'm certainly going to be contacting the governor's office and let him know how strongly I support it, and certainly going to urge my friends as well to do so. So, again, I'm really disappointed that the council decided that that legislation should be delayed. Secondly, I'm not ready to forget uh, Eric Curran's presentation at the last city council meeting and the position that was presented um, asking our city council to make a statement um, really validating the national elections that have been held and stating they understand that we have a duly elected president and vice president in the country. Um, I really would like an answer to the questions that were posed in the petition that uh, Eric Kern submitted. And I hope at some point the city council will at least respond to the hundreds of residents that signed that petition, really requesting the city council to make a statement. And then the last thing I want to mention tonight is that I'm strongly opposed to the MRRJ expansion. And rather than reiterate the comments that have been made, I, I strongly want to associate myself with the comments made by Sheila Mahdi and Mitch Narduzzi. Um, I am very much opposed to that expansion plan. I believe strongly in criminal justice reform. I don't know if any of you were able to participate, but Stan Organizing hosted a, a fantastic uh, webinar again on Tuesday night where we heard from many speakers from the area talking about some incredible alternatives to incarceration, um, ways we can increase access to mental health services, to substance use treatment, to the kinds of interventions that can really help people avoid engagement with the criminal justice system. And I wholeheartedly would like to see our city council make more investments in alternatives to incarceration and again, urge you to oppose any kind of uh, $40 million expansion for the Middle River Regional Jail. So thank you for hearing my comments tonight. Uh, I appreciate it. Good night. Thank you. Next caller. There are no further callers, Madam Mayor. Great. Since there's no further callers, I, as the mayor of the city of Stanton, declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you.